no one will deny that these are perilous times that we live in. But unless you're living in the Middle East, where Muslims are running rampant across the land, killing nearly 200,000 Christians each year, then most people don't give it a second thought. And at the same time, they never come to realize what time it really is because it's not banging on their door. They don't feel the urge to study God's word and get ready for what prophecy says will be some very intense times. And so when persecution finally hits close to home for most, it's going to be too late. Still, even though most don't know the prophetic signs of the times, it is extremely obvious that most people today are fearful for one reason or another. Hence the reason the so-called antidepressant drugs are so popular today. Which, by the way, if you read the side effects, you see they can also lead to worse anxiety and even suicide. But then that's a whole other sermon. In short, Satan has been very busy doing exactly as students of prophecy have expected him to do for some time now. It says in Luke 21, verse 26, that men's hearts are going to be failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And in today's world, that is a very easy prophecy to see fulfilled. And so again, what we see happening today is in perfect timing as to what was prophesied. And no, having this fear before dedicating yourself to Christ doesn't mean you're guaranteed hell. Prayerfully, that kind of fear will move you to seek him and gain salvation, wherein all fear is going to be gone anyway. And so it comes as no surprise to me that our Lord would have already touched on this fear in the hearts of many in his word. And sadly, this is another reason Satan keeps most people out of the Bible. For it is also written in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and tents of the heart. The word of God is that powerful. And with that deep of a connection to the soul of the believer, one can see how easily the peace of Jesus can be cultivated in the heart. And so you have to know, living in the last days as we are, the enemy's soul is going to do all he can to prevent this powerful book from being studied and read, or even trusted by most people. I mean, seriously, everyone needs to realize that this dying angel who seeks to be God of a dying world knows what he's been looking at for the last 6,000 years. He knows exactly how powerful Jesus and his word are. And so... That's going to be the focus of his attack so as to prevent losing any human trophies he's worked so hard to win over the years. Well, that all being said, were you aware that the term be not afraid comes up 28 times in the Bible, the King James Bible, 19 times in the Old Testament, nine times in the New? But as I was in the Word the other day, the Lord opened up to me one time in his Word wherein he said it from his own lips while walking on the water. Check it out. It's in Mark chapter 6. Now, to properly set this in context, because there are a lot of prophetic symbols here, we need to keep in mind that this miraculous event of him showing his power over all creation by walking on the water, this miracle happens right after Jesus fed the 5,000. And so we read in Mark chapter 6, verses 45 to 50, it says, And straight away he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and go to the other side before onto Bethsaida. Well, he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and cried out, for they all saw him. And were troubled. And immediately he talked with them and said, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. And so again, if we look around today, we see all sorts of people in abject fear on a daily basis to the point of taking the long prophesied drugs that Revelation calls sorceries to try and calm the fears, which actually only entraps them even deeper into the fear on a chemically based level now. They place their faith on the pill instead of the Lord, and that's where Satan needs them to be. And it's not just the legal drugs the AMA pushes. The street drugs and free-flowing alcohol from every spigot known to man is also the mind-numbing remedy for some people. And yes, that was prophesied for our day. For it is written in Second Timothy 3, verses 1 to 4, that in the last days men shall be lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And by the way, the fear many have deep within is mostly based on misconceptions of reality. Now, yes, reality itself can be quite scary when you look at the mass killings, the suicides, the wars and rumors of wars, and then, of course, which is happening in nature. But notice this. Luke 21, verses 25 to 27 says, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, 
men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. The fear of the people all over the world confirms this prophecy is fulfilled in our day. And yes, this prophecy is specifically for our day and our day alone. How do I know that? Well, the last verse in that passage says that after the fear wells up in their hearts, it is then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. That only happens at the end of the world, brothers and sisters. This is not a prophecy that can be marked at any other time in history. Even the Great Tribulation, wherein hundreds of millions of Christians were tortured and killed by the popes during the Inquisitions, cannot declare this prophecy for their day because this passage perfectly declares the timing by speaking of the second coming happening directly after it. And the mention of the signs in the sun and the moon and the stars does correlate directly with what Jesus stated in Matthew 24 when he was talking about the Great Tribulation, wherein no signs happened after the Vatican stopped killing the Christians in the late 1700s. I got them listed on the site. Because directly after Jesus mentions those signs, he states this in Matthew 24, 30. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, as we just read from Luke. Twenty-eight times the Lord has declared, be not afraid, in his word, for a reason. It has to do with who you believe. If you have fear... Then the one who spoke via the Holy Spirit in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 is declared a liar by those that are fearful in these last days because it's plainly written by Paul that God hath not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Putting all the scary things aside, think of this as well. For a Christian to declare he or she hath fear of ridicule, persecution, and even death means they don't believe Jesus. When he said in John fourteen twenty seven, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. And then he finishes by saying, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I mean, the bottom line here is this. Either you trust Jesus or you don't. And if you wrestle in this area of life, reading his word daily will eventually cause all that fear to just disappear. And so notice how this all works, brothers and sisters. Let's go back to Jesus on the water that night and watch what happened to get a better idea of his truth. Notice also all the prophetic symbolism that declares we too will see what the apostles saw in the boat that night. And sadly, like Peter, some in the church are going to sink in fear. So let's break it down, getting back to Mark chapter 6 there, verses 45 to 50. Let's break it down and we'll see. Jesus just gets done feeding the 5,000, as we know. And let me share two prophetic passages with you that will also remove some fear when it comes to the time we can't buy and sell. Isaiah 33, verse 16, it says, He shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given him. His waters shall be short. Now check out Psalm 78, verses 18 to 20. And they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. Yea, they spake against God, and they said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Behold, he smote the rock, and the waters gushed out, and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? And we know what happened, right? He did, in fact, send the quail as well as the manna. And so even the fear of wondering where your next meal is, is taken away by the Lord and the peace he promised you. It goes on to say in Psalms that those doubting he will do as he promised angers him. I mean, why is mankind so stupid to believe he won't keep his promises? I mean, our God is not flaky like Satan who has to lie just to get you to trust him. And so just as Jesus fed the people in the desert in a miraculous way moments before he appeared on the water that night, he fed 5,000 to make an obvious point to all what's entailed next. After feeding all the people, Jesus then commanded the apostles to get into the ship, head out in the exact same way he tells us to get busy doing the work. It then says that Jesus went into prayer that night, and yes, we are in the night of prophetic time as we speak, and he is right now in the presence of our Father doing all he can to assure that which his bride is called to do, she will do when his promised blessings flow upon her. And so we are doing the work as commanded, just as the apostles were commanded to be in the midst of the sea, which students of prophecy knows, being in the midst of many peoples, nations, and tongues. And is it not written in Ecclesiastes 11, verse 1, that we should cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days? All of us have been casting this truth he has given us upon many different waters, as some of us are thousands of miles apart and in different states as well as in different nations. 
And also notice how the Lord made it possible for us to meet online each Sabbath, wherein we can literally cast upon many waters from the comforts of our homes using an online church service. And continuing in what happened that night, just as Jesus was separated from the apostles while in prayer, Jesus is right now in constant communion with his Father in New Jerusalem, protecting, blessing, and guiding us as we do this work in the midst of the many waters he commanded us to go forth in. Jesus looks from where he is and sees the apostles on the sea and how they are toiling and rowing against the wind. As students of prophecy, we also know that the wind that is against us actually means false doctrine. And as he saw the apostles rowing against the wind, he looks down from heaven to see us toiling and rowing against all the false doctrines that the wolves are spewing forth in every soul or in the many waters we're trying to reach. And so press on. For it is also written in Ecclesiastes 11 verse 4 that he that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. And so ignore what the wolves are saying and do the work. And yes, one can see the connection between that warning and how it pertains to what we find in Proverbs 22:13, which says, The slothful man saith, There is a lion without, I shall be slain in the streets. We need to ignore all the false doctrines being spewed by the wolves as well as the threats being growled by the lions. We have a sacred duty, and we have been commanded by our King Jesus in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, to go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Okay, now, as Jesus was getting closer to the boat, all the apostles got frightened. And so just as he's getting closer to the world to appear in the eastern sky, all the people, and this includes most Christians, are scared out of the wits because they love the world and don't want it to end. And seeing the signs, consciously or even subconsciously, it means it really is all about to end. But those that know Jesus as Lord, Savior, and King hear his voice like his apostles heard on the boat that night when he said, It is I, be not afraid. In short, we really do look forward to the day when all that the world pummels us with on a daily basis will forever end. You know, this actually reminds me of a dream I had in my very early walk with the Lord. I was standing in the dining area of my parents' home, and as I looked out of the sliding glass doors, I saw the world was coming to an end outside. The eastern sky was ripping wide open, and I knew what it meant. And my knee-jerk reaction in the dream was to run away from the window to seek some sort of shelter because it literally frightened me to the core in a way I never felt before. And even though I knew it would be hopeless, I still ran away at first. But then a split second later, I realized deep within my heart that I really do love the Lord. And this is what I've been waiting and praying for all my life. And so I not only ran back to those glass doors, I flung them open and ran outside to take it all in. Romans chapter 8 verse 31 actually says that what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? In other words, Satan himself, with all the scary lies that he pumps into our minds while awake or even while we're sleeping in nightmares, he won't be able to stop even the youngest babe in Christ that steps out in faith from realizing and even proclaiming the truth. And like the apostles of old, the knee-jerk reaction may very well be fear like they had when they thought Jesus was a ghost. But when the child of God comes to his or her senses, then a smile grows from ear to ear knowing their Lord and Savior is close by. You know, I was extremely green in the truth when I had that dream. And like many of you who have had similar dreams, when faith kicks in, Satan has no chance whatsoever to stop us from doing as King Jesus commands. And so don't think ill of yourself if you have fear for a split second or two. If you're an obedient child of God who loves him and embraces his word as truth, you will snap out of it quite easily. You know, it may take a moment or two, but you'll come to see the truth. Hence the reason Satan never bothered to tempt Peter a fourth time that night after he denied Jesus three times. Peter's faith finally kicked in when that rooster crowed, and Satan had to flee and come up with a different way to attack him because he knew it would be a waste of time to tempt him now. He would have said, oh, yeah, yeah, I was with him. He wouldn't have any problem at all. But getting back to the boat, we now see that during that night on the water, Jesus was literally coming to them in the fourth watch of the night. If you have seen my study on the website about seven churches and four movements, you know that we, the remnant of her seed, are right now in the fourth watch doing the work, just as prophecy predicted and historic record now confirms. It is during the fourth watch that we see the apostles noticing a man walking on the sea, and at first the knee-jerk reaction is they become fearful, right? Now we can look at this in two ways. Number one, 
When Antichrist arrives in the fourth and final watch of the night that we are in right now, many will be very troubled and even fearful when that happens. For them, it'll be a great ordeal to escape that fear because that type of fear is not of God. For Satan has no power over God's people in this respect. That kind of fear comes from Satan's obedient people. And number two, when some of us see the sign of the Lord coming in the clouds sometime before he actually splits that sky, some of us will be troubled with a godly fear knowing we are undone and not ready to meet him. It is then the prophetic utterance from Isaiah will make better sense to us. For it is written in Isaiah 6 verse 5, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. But if you notice, immediately after the apostles see Jesus on the water, Jesus declares, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. He says that quickly. Because he loves his bride that much. And since she loves him too, that kind of fear is easily washed away because it is only there due to how much we love him and want to be the better for it, as Isaiah intimates in the comment about being undone. Yes, we are undone, but we only feel that way because of our king and how we seek to emulate his perfection and still fall far short of it. And since this all happened in the fourth watch of the night for the apostles, that means this all happened in the hours right before sunrise. Being in the fourth watch prophetically as we are right now, the next thing that happens is the Son of God appearing in the eastern sky like an eternal sunrise unto all his people, for we are now headed to New Jerusalem, wherein it says in Revelation 22, verse 5, that there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And now, Check out what happens next. And notice how Satan will always seek a way to take advantage if given a chance. Right after Jesus calms their fear, notice what happens next. Matthew 14, verses 28 to 33. It says, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus' butt. When he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come to the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Okay, there's a lot here, so bear with me for a moment. And by the way, just so you know, walking on water for Peter is just as miraculous and unnatural as it will be for those of us that will be flying into the air to meet the Lord Jesus at his second coming on that great and dreadful day. But notice this. Jesus puts forth a command. This time it is merely to come onto the water with him. Peter steps out and is actually walking on the water here. But suddenly he takes his eyes off Jesus. And that is when Satan took advantage. Peter was a fisherman. He knew all about the dangers of the sea, and especially in a storm. And so Satan welled up that fear and all those memories of the past of perils that Peter had in his heart and memory by whispering all sorts of facts about how dangerous it was to be standing on the water in the midst of a storm. And because Peter took his eyes off Jesus, Satan's voice became very difficult to ignore. And so Peter's memories of days gone by and hearing about and even seeing all sorts of dangers on the sea came into mind with perfect clarity, no doubt. And suddenly the truth Jesus presented to his heart was clouded over by his fleshly eyewitness accounts of how dangerous the sea can be. See, that's how Satan likes to play his games. He uses that which is before our eyes rather than that which is before our hearts. Sadly, Peter's faith in the truth that Jesus had offered him faded for a moment and was replaced just long enough for him to believe what he is being tempted to see, and then he sank in the water. But because of the fact the comforter had not yet been placed within Peter, Jesus stretched forth his hand to save Peter, and the moment they both stepped back into the ship, all the lies of Satan, which was represented by that wind that night, was gone. All of them could easily see now Jesus was the Son of God. Soon, we too will be in a place we have been commanded to be, wherein many peoples all over the world will obey the command to come to know the Lord as he should be known. Some of us will even be commanded to step out in ways as did Peter on the water so as to glorify the Lord 
And when we do so, that stepping out will make us very bright targets for Satan to focus on. And so expect that hit, brothers and sisters. Don't let the enemy cloud your faith with all those fleshly so-called realities when Jesus can literally change realities in ways that the most learned scientists can't even explain. Hence the reason they have tried for centuries to nullify the fact that he walked on water. And yes, this is also why some magicians fake walking on water today so as to make that which happened that night appear suspicious. But again, Jesus controls his creation in perfection. And not only will some of us be able to step out of the proverbial boat one day, all of us, if we are obedient to the end, we will fly to meet with Jesus in the air. All of us will be. And some of us have already been tested in similar ways to lose faith so as to allow fear to well up in the heart. I recall years ago when 11 doctors were telling me that my son was going to die before sunrise. And that got to me that evening as I was in prayer. But as I was praying, the Lord placed a very obvious thought into my mind, wherein I saw Jesus on the water, and him asking me to step out onto the sea, just as he did with Peter. As I did so, I saw all sorts of doctors bobbing in the water all around me, spewing all sorts of scary things about my child's soon demise. But the thought became clear as to what I was being reminded of regarding what happened that night 2,000 years ago. And so I ignored all the doctors. And my son survived that very night. They said that he would die. And not long after that, he walked out of that hospital. All of us are going to be tested in very strong ways very soon. But do not have any fear at all, brothers and sisters, because we know what time it is. We know the task at hand. We also know that we are being targeted. And soon that latter rain will fall. And we will step out of that boat and do a work no other people could do. And not long after stepping out, we too will see the wind of false doctrine whipping all around us. But at the same time, it will completely stop when our faith kicks in. And then we will see the Lord coming in the clouds with great glory and know what the apostles knew that night. With perfect clarity, the split second Jesus stepped into that boat. He truly is the Son of God. He truly is our Savior. He truly is our King and Creator. And He truly is coming soon. Thank you for watching. God bless.